Cross Point Church. My name is Jeff Pope. I'm one of the pastors here. We are so glad that you've joined us today and are here to just enjoy the worship of the Lord. So let's all stand together. We're going to sing some songs, and Pastor Jesse's going to come and preach the word to us today. And we're just going to have a great time in the Lord. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your goodness, your mercy, and your grace. And God, we exalt you. We just want to worship you right now, God, for everybody who brought all their stuff into this place. Lord, we lay it at your feet. We just want to say, God, here it is. We lay everything down. This is your time. God, speak to us through our worship, God, as we worship corporately to you, together with your people. And then as Pastor Jesse comes, bless his message. Use it to speak to our hearts that, God, we would be your servants, your followers, and we would live out as the light that you've called us to be. God, we praise your name. Amen. There's no space that his love can reach. There's no place where we can find peace. There's no end to amazing grace. Oh, take me in with your love spread wide. Take me in like an orphan child. Never let go, never leave. 
Father, we praise you and we thank you for your goodness, your mercy, and your grace. God, bless this time. Bless Pastor Jesse and use your word to glorify your name. Amen. Hey, man, you guys can have a seat. How's everybody this morning? It's good to see you. Move that out of the way. Get set up here. Glad to see you guys this morning. It's been a cool week. Cross Point students started back this week. It was fun. Okay, we had a party and then it rained. Every time we do something outside, it rains. But it was good. So 50 or 60 kids, I don't know. I lost count. We had a good time. So thanks for letting me hang out uh, with your kids. Uh, let's just get started. I'll start by talking about my wife this morning, um, which is, yeah, I know. It's dangerous, right? I cleared it with her this morning. I learned that a long time ago that if I'm going to say something about her, probably ought to ask her in advance, you know, because I get surprised at the things that have gotten me in trouble over time. But uh, she may be watching at home. I don't know, but she's not in this room. So I'm a little extra safe, okay? Wait for now. But, but here's the thing about my wife. She has a lot of really great qualities. She's good at a lot of things, a lot of things that I'm not good at. And one of the things that she's really good at, better than me, is that she notices things, right? She pays attention and notices things that I walk by a thousand times and never notice. And what she's also really good at, it's a special skill, is that she uh, tells me the things that she notices that I didn't notice, Okay. <laughs> Guys, you, anybody else, got, is that okay to say? Does that sound condescending? I, I, know, I, I cleared it with her this morning. For example, like the other day in the garage, it was a mess apparently. I hadn't noticed. She says, we got to do something about this garage. I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> apparently that was the wrong thing to say. She said, look at it. I said, it looks the same as it always does, which was the second dumb thing that I said because <laughs> apparently she had straightened it up just a couple of weeks before. But she noticed some things that I hadn't noticed. The other night, I had fallen asleep on the couch watching TV, which is something, because I'm like an old man now, something that I do. I, I also felt really old this morning. Like at about 7 o'clock this morning, Caroline came in, and she informed me. I don't know why she felt like she needed to do that at 7 o'clock in the morning. She came in just to inform me that from now on, she would only be drawing my pictures completely bald. Like she said, he, she said it's really not even worth drawing hair anymore at all, just all bald from here on out. Whatever. Yeah, but the other night I fell asleep on the couch watching TV and somewhere in the middle of the night I was awakened to find that I had spilled the Diet Coke that I'd been drinking the night before there on the couch. And so I did what anybody would do um, in the middle of the night like that. I took off my sock and I tried to use it to, uh, <laughs> to clean, the, clean the couch cushion and it didn't work that well. And so then I did what any, after that, any self-respecting, you know, like manly, hairy-chested, you know, complimentarian, pants wearing, yeah, testosterone grunting, uh, man of my house, spiritual leader of my home would do. Um, I flipped the cushion over so that my wife wouldn't find out. And then, I, right, then, then, that's right, that's why they're, two, they're the same, Daughter. And then I rearranged the throw pillows just a little bit, you know, so that she wouldn't know. And then I went back to sleep just right where I was. And so 5.15 or so rolls around the next morning. She gets up early because she works hard, and she's stumbling around. Nobody else is up in the house, and she's working hard to get everything ready. You know, she's working hard to get the kids ready, and that takes a little bit. And then she's getting herself ready, which takes less time, you know, because she's, you know, beautiful already. And then she, she came in there. See what I did there, Dalton? That was good. <laughs> and, and, then, and then so she comes in there, and there's no light on in the house except, like, the faint blue glow of the TV that I have left on the night before. No lights in the house. It's 5.15 in the morning. And I hear somebody say, Jesse, wake up. You know what she said? She said, did you spill something last night? <laughs> How is that possible? That, like she, can she smell it? Did, 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 did it have, she got x-ray vision. She, she's like superwoman, this woman. How did she notice? She said, well, the cushion's upside down. I said, it's not upside down. It's the same on both sides. Or it was until I spilled that thing on it on one side. But she has this ability to notice things that I miss over and over again. It's like a superpower. She pays attention to stuff that I never even see, that I can walk by a thousand times. And the Lord Jesus had this ability, didn't he? To pay attention to things and to people to notice in the crowd of a million people, people followed him everywhere he went. He had this uncanny ability to pick out the one person in that crowd that needed something from him in that moment. He paid attention to them. He locked eyes with them, and in that moment, over and over again, it changed their life. 
forever. We're going to talk about that a little bit today. This is me going on like a sidebar right here from the beginning. You know, one of the greatest gifts that you can give somebody, it's not flowers, guys. It's not a new car. It's not gift cards. I love, you know, I like gift cards and new cars. One of the greatest gifts that you can give somebody, we've said this before, one of the greatest gifts you can give somebody is your undivided attention. Because when you somebody, when you lock eyes with somebody and you put your phone down and you set everything else aside and you give somebody your undivided attention, you are giving to them something. It's, it's a resource that you cannot get back. You can make more money. You can buy more stuff. You can go on more trips. But you can't get back your time pay attention. I was thinking about that this week. My kid's probably in the room. This will embarrass him and whatever. But when I look back, and, and some of you parents, if this feels personal, it's not. I'm not got anybody in mind. There's no judgment here. This is only confessional. As I'm getting to this phase with my kid, where I look at it, and I might get tearful because I do that. You know, I, I got maybe just a couple of years left with him in my house. When I look back on the time that I've spent with my kid and how fast that it's gone. You know what I don't regret? I don't ever sit back and think, you know what, we could have played in a couple more travel ball tournaments. I never think that, right? I don't look back and think to myself, you know what, I wish that I had made a little more money so I could have paid for a few more cool experiences or I wish that we'd got to go on more vacation. You know what I wish, though, what I think about a lot of the time is that I wish that I had paid more attention to the things that really matter. I wish that I'd looked him in the eye and done a better job teaching him to pray well. I wish that I'd looked him in the eyes and you know what? I need to do a better job, son, of making sure that the word of God is etched onto your soul and into your heart the way it's supposed to be. I wish that I had paid more attention. I wish that I'd paid more attention to teaching him how to love a wife better and to lead a family well. Pay more attention to these things. Anyway. I don't know why I just went on and ran about my kid, but I do that. Anyway, here's, here's the deal. Jesus had an uncanny ability to notice things that nobody noticed, people that nobody noticed, brokenness that nobody noticed, hurting, sick and sickness that nobody noticed. He paid attention to people, and it changed their life forever. So we're going to look at a story this morning. It's a short story. From Luke 5, 12 through 16, and I'll tell you right from the beginning that the story's a little gross. A little gross, a little gory, a little gritty. That was good alliteration right there. Any Purell fans in the house? Caroline calls it Hanitizer, you know? Makes me feel so clean. I, I use it like all the way up to my shoulders. Some, sometimes I don't even bathe at all. I just rub it all over myself. That's not true, and it was too much information. But get out your Purell. A little gross, Luke 5, 12. Here's what it says. It says, while Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. It says he was covered with leprosy. Matthew and Mark also tell this story, but they leave out this detail. Only in Luke's gospel do we get this detail that he was covered in leprosy. It's like a medical term, meaning like it was an advanced case. In Alexander County terms, he's eat up with it, right? So why, why would we get this medical term from Luke that we don't get from the other Gospels. Do you know? He was a doctor, right? Not only a Gospel writer, but he was a doctor. And so he gives us this extra detail, this medical term. It says, he was covered with leprosy, and when he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground. And he begged him, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Amen? See, the Pharisees, these religious leaders that were always giving Jesus a hard time, these religious leaders that thought they were so close to God, so self-righteous, they never bowed their face before Jesus, did they? They didn't see him for who he was. The truth is they didn't think they needed to be made clean in the first place. But people like this leper and shameful women and little children and sick people, tax collectors, they recognized who he was, what he was capable of. He calls him Lord. And he bows himself in humility, low position of worship. He says, Lord, I don't know if you will. You don't have to. I don't deserve it. 
I don't know if you're going to do what I'm asking you to do today. But I'm telling you in full faith right now that I believe with my whole heart that you can if you want to. If you're willing. Make me clean. In verse 13 it says that Jesus reached out his hand. And he touched the man. And the Greek word for touched is hopto. It means literally that he laid hold of, that he fastened on to. What it doesn't say is that like Benny Hinn style, televangelist style, that he walked up to this dude and just knocked him in the forehead and he fell over. There's nothing in the Bible about that anywhere. It doesn't say exactly what Jesus did. It just says he latched on to the man. Maybe he bent down and he took one hand and he put it on his shoulder. Maybe he grabbed both hands. Maybe he bent down and grabbed both shoulders. I believe probably though Jesus looked this dude in the eye. Maybe for the first time that anybody looked him in the eye in a really long time. Maybe even he reached out and embraced the man. He hugged him. I don't know. This is what Jesus says. He says, I am willing, he said. Be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Then Jesus ordered him. Don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. This was a small town, probably like a village. People had probably grown up knowing this guy. They knew him before he had leprosy. And word probably spread when he got leprosy that he had leprosy. And there were some rules in place. You can't if you've had leprosy, which is contagious. We'll talk about that in a minute. You can't just start knocking on doors to tell everybody, hey, I'm clean. It's going to freak people out. Nobody wants to get that. So Jesus says, follow the rules. Follow the rules. Go find yourself. Apparently people were healed sometimes. It was incurable. It's probably misdiagnosed a lot too. But apparently sometimes people got healed. So there was a process by which a priest could declare you clean. So Jesus says, follow the process so that it doesn't wig anybody out. But also maybe so these religious leaders that are giving me a hard time all the time will know that I've respected the law and followed the rules. Verse 15, it says, yet the news about him spread all the more. So that crowds of people came to hear him, meaning Jesus, and he healed their, be healed of their sickness. It says, but Jesus often withdrew. The lonely places and prayed. So let's spend some time talking about leprosy a little bit. I need some water. I found some. I thought I didn't bring any water, but I stole somebody's from behind that speaker over there. <laughs> let's talk about leprosy a little bit. Leprosy still exists today. It is curable now, but it wasn't curable then. It's called something else now. But leprosy with this horrible, incurable at the time, infectious skin disease. It would cause it started as a rash and then it would cause sores to come up all over the body. And the sores would get so large, particularly in the face, they would become so large that people would be disfigured to the point that they were unrecognizable to people that had known them forever. Those sores would open up and they would ooze, and lepers people smelled horrible. It affected their joints to the point that they would become paralyzed. It affected their vocal cords, sometimes to the point where they couldn't talk at all. In the 1950s, this guy named Dr. Paul Brandt grew up in a missionary home in, in India, devoted much of his life to, to hanging out with leprous people and studying the disease. And here's what he determined. He said the worst part of leprosy, in his opinion, even though he didn't have it, the worst part of leprosy was that people would lose all sense of touch. The nerve endings all over their body would ultimately die off together, altogether. They couldn't feel a thing. He said it was a misnomer. It had been a myth up to that time that leprosy in advanced cases would cause people's flesh and their limbs actually to die and to rot off of their body. But he said that wasn't true. He said, well, what did happen, though, is that because a lot of these people were homeless and they slept in horrible places and in gutters and on the side of the road, it is they would lay there sleeping because they couldn't feel anything, that rodents and other animals would come and gnaw off their flesh and parts of their body. Because their nerve endings were dead, they didn't even wake up to feel it. 
It's horrible. It's a horrible disease. They get infected and ultimately is what would lead to their death. But not only was leprosy this horrible physical illness, horrible as it was, maybe worse than that even was the social stigma that went with it. Social stigma and a moral one. Because the Pharisees taught that leprosy was sent by God as a curse to spiritually unclean people. There were some rules about how lepers had to operate. As they were coming to town, most of you heard this, as they were coming to town, they would have to shout about themselves, you know, unclean, unclean, so people would stay away. Many of them even rang a bell, like a siren or an alarm. Here I come, you know. You, you, you better run away because I promise you, you don't want anything that I got. Not that they probably saw people all that often anyway, right? Because the moment somebody was discovered to have had leprosy, they were removed sometimes forcibly from their homes, removed from their spouse, maybe to never see them again. Cut off completely from their children, their friends, could no longer make a living, lost their purpose, the face become so deformed they lost their identity through no fault of their, their own. Lose everything about themselves. Become really, if you think about it, I think maybe the, the loneliest, most unwanted people that ever walked the face of the earth. Mother Teresa, who also, like the doctor we talked about a little bit ago, devoted much of her life to studying leprosy, ministering to people with lepers in the streets of Calcutta. She said this. She said, we have drugs for people with diseases like leprosy now. But the drugs do not treat the main problem. The disease of being unwanted. The disease of being unwanted. I think maybe is the worst disease of all. Don't you think? The disease of being unwanted is the worst because that disease I believe is, is timeless. And for some of you, you have been there. You've had that disease. You've, you've felt unwanted. Some of you feel that way right now. You feel unwanted like you never quite fit. Like people have tolerated you maybe but chosen you maybe never. You feel unwanted maybe because of your appearance. Like you never quite measured up that way. Some of you feel unwanted because somewhere along the way somebody walked out on you. Somebody abandoned you. And ever since that time, you've never really believed that anybody could ever really want you. It has affected every relationship you've had your entire life. Can't seem to get over it. Maybe you feel unwanted because somewhere along the way you made some decisions. You made some decisions, you made some poor choices, you earned yourself a reputation, maybe rightly, but you've never been able to live it down. Everybody knows about you, and when you walk into town, you don't have to shout unclean, unclean, because it's like everybody knows. And no matter how hard you've tried since, you can't seem to live it down. It's a pervasive sense of feeling like you never quite fit. Like you almost do maybe, like life kind of happens around you, but you're never quite a part of it. I imagine these leprous people sort of felt that way. Christmas is coming, right? We, we, we started planning like a week or two ago. I get excited. Christmas is, Christmas times are coming. It's my favorite time of year. We got a lot of cool stuff that's going to happen around here at Christmas time. But have you ever seen the movie A Christmas Carol? Most of you have. I don't know if it's like the Charles Dickens-esque uh, version or like the Scrooge McDuck version. Either one, they're kind of the same. In principle, at least. But maybe it was like that for these leprous people. Like you're a ghost sort of looking in on your life. Where you see your old house and you can't quite go in. Like maybe across town you see your, your spouse that you used to have, sort of. But you can't go over and talk to them. 
you get close enough to a crowd of people, maybe you hear somebody telling a story with your kid's name in it, but it's a kid that you can't even know. It's like life is happening, and you're kind of looking in, but you never get to be quite a part of it. Like you're still alive, but almost kind of dead. I imagine they felt that way. Some of you felt that way. So we don't know really how long it had been since this guy experienced any kind of human touch at all. Since he had held somebody's hand or shaken somebody's hand, had an embrace from his wife, put his arm around his own kid. He even got up close enough to somebody in the crowd to brush up against him. See, it was illegal for him to touch people at all. It was actually a legal issue, punishable by, by prison or maybe worse for a leprous person to come in contact with somebody. And there were several reasons for that, partly because they were contagious, but partly also because the Pharisees taught that these people were spiritually unclean. If you came in contact with a leper, it meant that you were also spiritually unclean. Not allowed to touch anybody for fear of reprisal. Legally. A, a strict rabbi, one of these religious leaders, a strict rabbi would be the last person on planet earth that a leprous person would ever want to come in contact with the, for fear of what would happen to them. They don't want to go to prison. And, and what's interesting is these religious leaders had prided themselves on being so close to God so self-righteous and so pious and so close to God that they had made themselves altogether unapproachable to broken, needy, sick people like this who needed the love of God the very most. And what's the beautiful irony of this story? The beautiful irony of this story is that the one rabbi, the one rabbi that this leper felt comfortable reaching out to was the one rabbi who was actually God himself. Isn't that beautiful? So I want to ask this question. It's a question that I ask of myself in one way or another almost every day of my life. At, at gas stations and at Walmart and in my house and in my office and at this church and because it, it's important to me. And the question is this, simply, am I approachable? Because it's important to me that I remain approachable. Am I approachable or have I become just a little bit pious, you know? Just a, a little bit self-righteous. I, I watched an old Saturday Night Live rerun. Who's old enough in here to remember like the Dana Carvey, the church lady, right? The, just, a, just a little bit superior, remember? It's a bad impression. It's the best I got. Yeah, you like, okay, just, just checking. I didn't work on it or anything. It just kind of came out that way. It's a little bit superior. Do I give off a vibe? When people get a sense of me, do they get a sense that if I go to that guy, he'll be good to me? If I go to that guy, he's probably busy, but I'll find grace with him. Or instead, do I give off this vibe, maybe, that I could go to him, but he's probably going to think that what I got is not worth his time. See, I want to be the most approachable guy on the planet. You know why? Because Jesus was the most approachable guy on the planet. And it ought to be my life's mission to be just like him. And see, the difference between me and you is that Jesus really was superior, and not just a little bit. The most superior being in all the universe apparently is also the most approachable being in all the universe. That's why people like this guy and prostitutes and tax collectors and little children and, and fish and all these people that religion had forgotten felt comfortable to come and to approach so let me ask you this. How approachable are you? It's a practical question. We're talking about approachability. I think approachability is one of the most forgotten, underappreciated qualities of Jesus. How approachable are you? Husbands, are you approachable? Or are you right? Because you can rarely be both. It's hard to prioritize both at the same time. I learned that at my house this week. There's a situation with my kid, and it's always awkward because, you know, he's in the room. But, but there's a situation with my kid, and I was right. He was not right. But I will assure you that the point I had to make or what I had to go through to prove my point was not worth it. 
it was not worth the approachability that I lost in that moment because maybe next time he's less willing to approach me because of how what he got the last time he approached me. Are you approachable or are you right, husband? Wives, are you approachable or does everybody in your house have to walk on eggshells around you all the time because they're not sure what your reaction is going to be? Parents, are you approachable? Are you approachable? Even though your kids know that they might receive discipline, do they also know that they're going to find grace with you? Because they won't come to you if that's not the case. What about with your friends? Are you the kind of person that that people can come to because it's easy for you to or for, easy for them to ask a favor of you? Or do you give off this vibe that my time's a little bit too valuable to have to deal with your problem? Are you approachable? Because Jesus was approachable. This leper took a risk. He took a risk. He knew the law. He knew the potential implications socially, legally. But there was something about this man Jesus. Something about him that made him think, you know what, maybe just this one time, you know, it might be safe for me to approach. It could be just this one time that I might even be welcomed by this man. And it doesn't say that the leper initiated the contact, does it? He kept his distance at least to a degree. But the Bible says he comes in a, in a position of humility and, and worship, and he buries his face probably in shame. He's probably horribly disfigured by this point. His face is not something probably that he's been proud of for a really long time. But in humility, he buries his face in front of the Lord Jesus. And in spite of the fact that there was potential social implications for Jesus, but in spite of the fact that the Pharisees gave him a hard time anyway, in spite of the fact that this man was in fact actually contagious, it says that Jesus reached out his hand and he laid hold of the man. And he says, I'm willing. Be clean. You know what's amazing about this? I mean, besides the fact that Jesus had just healed this man and performed this miracle, we don't need to overlook that. I mean, that's miraculous. It's amazing. I can't heal anybody. Only Jesus does that. It's miraculous. We don't need to gloss over it. But just as miraculous to me is that there's this thing in Jesus that knew somehow that before this man received his healing that this man needed to be touched. Been a long time since this guy needed, had been touched at all, don't you think? Who knows how long it had been? Years maybe since he'd ever had any human contact from anybody, and Jesus knows, before I heal this man, I need to touch this man. I'm going to embrace this man. That Jesus didn't need to touch the man in order to heal the man, you know that? He could have just set up a booth, right? Like drive-through healings. He could have done that right on the side of the road. Be like, you know, like I need a, I need a super size number one leprosy healing, you know? With like a sign of sight to the blind. He could have done that. You could have just driven through. He could have tweeted out healing vibes and healed everybody in town. But Jesus realizes this man needs to be touched. And he reaches out and he embraces the man. There's an author you, author you might be familiar with. It's been controversial of late, but it doesn't change that this is still a beautiful story. He writes about this. Max Licato writes this. He says, I saw him. And before he spoke, I knew that he cared. Somehow I knew that he hated this disease as much, no more than I hated it. And he descended the hill and I waited until he was only paces from me and then I stepped out. Unclean, someone shouted. Sorry, my voice cracked like Peter Brady right there. Unclean, someone shouted and I don't blame him. I was a huddled mass of death. But I scarcely heard him. I scarcely saw him. The, the panic... I'd seen that a thousand times. His compassion, however, I'd never beheld. Everyone stepped back except for him, and he stepped toward me. And I said, 
Lord, you can heal me if you will. And had he healed me with the word, I would have been thrilled. Had he cured me with a prayer, I would have rejoiced, but he touched me. Imagine that, unworthy of the touch of a man, yet worthy of the touch of God. It's beautiful, right? God wired us to need to be touched sometimes. You've heard that laughter is the best medicine. There's actually some truth to that. There's a study that's been done that shows that people that laugh a lot actually live longer. There's another study that's been done that shows that people who have regular, meaningful, physical contact actually are less depressed, they have stronger immune systems, and they live longer. If both of those things are true, I'm going to live a really long time, okay? Like 171 years or something because I like to laugh a lot and I'm secure enough in my masculinity to admit that I'm a little bit of a hugger, okay? But this is more than that. Like all the non-huggy people in the room are really nervous right now because like, I don't know where he's going with this, but if this message is going to end with some kind of weird hug fest, I'll just tell you I'm out the door right now. I, I, that's not that. This is more than, than, than high fives and handshakes and, and arms around. That stuff's important sometimes. This is more than that. But here's the deal. There's a world full of people an office full of people, a church full of people, a school full of people, students, who are crying out in all kinds of ways for you to reach out to them. They need something from you. And they may never ask for it out loud. They may never fall on their face and beg for it like this guy, but they are crying out for it in all kinds of ways. They need to be touched. They need you to lay hold of them. They need help from you. Okay, because here's the thing, you've never locked eyes with another man or woman on this planet that does not matter dearly to you. Never locked eyes with another man or woman on this planet that he was not willing to die for. And yet here's the tragic thing, 2,000 years later, 2,000 years later, after Jesus has given us all these beautiful, crystal clear examples of what it looks like to break down social barriers and, and gender barriers and racial barriers and sickness barriers and all this stuff, 2,000 later, years later, with every social set, every culture, every subculture, there are still some untouchable people in this world. So I'll ask you this uncomfortable question and you probably know what's coming. Who are your untouchable people? Who's untouchable to you? Are they untouchable because of how they vote? That's a hard one right now. Hard for me. Are they untouchable because of how they look? Are they untouchable because they got tattoos in weird places? Because they got weird piercings? Are they untouchable because of how they smell? Are they untouchable because their religion is different than yours? Are they untouchable because their gender's weird? Are, are they untouchable because they're gay? Are they untouchable because they immigrated here from somewhere else? And here's one that hits closer to home probably than all of that for everybody in this room. Are they untouchable because they wounded you? Here's what happens. Sometimes people did something to you somewhere a long way back. And now they need you. Now they're wounded. Now they could use for you to lay hold of them. But because they wounded you, you've kept them and maybe everybody else in your own life at arm's length. Maybe you've become altogether unapproachable because of that. Maybe everybody's just a little bit untouchable to you. A couple of weeks ago, I went to Blowing Rock. I took Amy. And, you know, Blowing Rock's got all these shops in there, right? And, and, and the shops that I don't particularly love, you know, but they got all this really expensive stuff like handmade art and like blown glass and these little figurines and statues and things. I got to tell you this, I'm really not built to walk around in shops like that, you know? Like a bull in a china shop in there. I'm always nervous I'm just going to knock something off the shelf. But invariably, some of those shops have these signs that say things like this. Don't touch, right? Don't touch. You know, like, I break, I cry, you break, you buy. 
You break it, you bought it. Incidentally, if you're a shop owner and you have one of those really unwelcoming signs up in your shop, I'm never going to spend any money with you, just so you know. I get nervous in there like I'm going to knock something off a shelf. All this breakable stuff. But here's the point of that, and you can see it coming. Is it it every day of your life, tomorrow when you wake up, every day of your life, you're going to brush against some people who are really, really fragile. You're going to come in contact with some really easily broken people. And every one of those people, God says, you know what, I have placed an incredible price tag on this one. Incredibly valuable to me. I'm willing to pay this much for this one. And around the neck of every one of those people, he places a sign, I believe. This one here is beautiful to me. This one's really fragile. So handle with care, but but please touch. This one here is worth so much to me, but is so easily broken. So handle with care, but please touch. Around every neck, please touch, please touch. Please touch somebody in your world. Somebody in your world, maybe in your own home, in your neighborhood, in your house, in your family, in your job. Somebody in your world is desperate for you to lay hold of them. Maybe to to put an arm of comfort around them, literally maybe. Maybe they need a phone call from you today. Maybe they need a word of encouragement that they haven't heard in a really long time. Maybe God's bringing the the names of some people in your life that you haven't reached out to in a really long time. Maybe he's bringing some names to mind right now and I wouldn't ignore it. Take note of it. People need you. So this man comes to Jesus in pure faith, fully convinced. Lord, I know that you can. The, The question at hand here never was for this guy whether or not he could. He knew Jesus could. He calls him Lord. He says, if you're willing, I know you can. The question here is, is are you that kind of God or not? And Jesus says, I am that kind of God. Sorry. As usual, I got to skip stuff because I talk too long. Here we go. And they got me this cool little clock right here that tells me exactly what time it is. And, you know, I'm watching. I'm going to skip to this part. Psalm 34, 18 says this. It says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. This is a beautiful verse. God, I'm convinced there's some people in this room that need to hear this verse this morning. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. Some of you are brokenhearted this morning. Some of you specifically, I know. Broken hearted this morning because of a loss. Broken hearted because of something that happened to you. Broken hearted because no matter what you have tried, it has not worked out and you have given up almost. You're crushed in spirit. Dreams have been crushed over and over again. And if that's you this morning, if any part of that is you this morning, I want you to know that this is a promise from God that says that the Lord is close, not that he would like to be close, or not that if you ask him, he'll come close. It says the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. And in the midst of your trouble, he wants to save you if you're crushed in spirit. The Lord's close to the brokenhearted. I went on vacation a couple years ago to Washington, D.C., and I went to the National Museum of History. And you know what I learned there is that, that Thomas Jefferson, who might be my favorite founding father, was not much of a hugger. You know, he, because he was, I think, that's speculative, but, but he was not comfortable with a really close and personal God. They have on display there one of those glass cases, this leather-bound book. It's called the Thomas Jefferson Bible, and he read from it nearly every day toward the end of his life. But it's not, they call it a Bible, but it's not really the Bible. It's just like cut and paste parts of the Bible. Like all the teachings and all the wisdom of Jesus, but none of the miracles of Jesus. No feeding the 5,000, no healing blind guys, no healing lepers. See, because apparently Thomas Jefferson was close, or comfortable. He was really comfortable with the, the, the wise teacher Jesus, the man of wisdom, life coach Jesus, which is important. 
but he was not comfortable with Jesus as a personal healer. See, I want you to know that every miracle in that scripture, that I believe it happened just like the Bible says it happened. Do you believe that? I believe they all happened. But I think we miss out on something when we focus just on the miracles as spectacles. It wasn't just about the miracle. See, the miracle was not just so Jesus could prove that he was God, although that might have been part of it. There's a lot of ways that Jesus could have proven that he was God. He didn't have to answer to anybody anyway. The miracles were not just so that Jesus could draw a crowd, although that might have been part of it. Jesus didn't need any help drawing a crowd. People followed him wherever he went. So why did Jesus heal people? See, it wasn't just about the healing. It wasn't just about the healing. You know what happened to every person that Jesus ever healed? They died. They all died. I don't know how. They got old. They got run over by a camel. I'm not sure, but all I know is they're not walking around anymore. If the, if the point had been just the bodily healing, then those people would be walking around 2,000 years later telling the story about how that one time Jesus healed them, and it would be a great story to tell, but they're not here. Jesus didn't heal everybody. We got these few isolated accounts. So why did Jesus heal people? Jesus healed people. To answer the question once and for all. To demonstrate once and for all that God's not some cosmically disconnected force. He's not some disconnected creator that speaks everything into existence and then sits back in his cosmic recliner just to watch everything go down. Every one of those healings, and this one maybe especially, gives us this beautiful glimpse into the very heart of the Father God that says, I really am that approachable. I really do care about your specific brokenness. In the distance between me and you, it was so far that you could never travel that far. So I came down to you to get close to you, brokenhearted people. Because God is close to the brokenhearted. And the wall, this barrier between me and you that sin had created, that was so high that you could never climb, he says, I've come all the way here so that I could break it down completely. Because I want healing for you, I do. And I want worship from you, that's part of it. But more than everything, I want intimacy with you. Because I really am that approachable. I really am that close. I really am that kind of God. Nobody had touched this leper. Nobody touched lepers at all. He was infectious and they were worried about getting infected. Yet Jesus touches this leper. And instead of Jesus becoming infected with leprosy, don't you think that Jesus infects this man with something altogether different? With love and grace and mercy. And Jeff, you can come on, buddy. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't give Jeff the signal ahead of time. Jesus says, don't tell. Don't tell anybody about this. Mark 1, 45, it says, Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. He didn't listen. He couldn't help it. And as a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed on the outside in lonely places. In lonely places, it says, yet the people came from, came from everywhere. Can you blame that guy? Can you blame him for not being able to keep his mouth shut about this amazing thing that had happened to him? Here's what I want us to know as we're wrapping this thing up. What happened to this leper, this broken man, is not one ounce more miraculous than what has happened in the hearts of everybody in this room who has received grace through Jesus. So how can we be quiet about that? How could we possibly not tell the good thing that's happened to us? What's great about Cross Point Church, why it's been successful all this time, is that you're sitting around some people you don't even know. Some people in this room, maybe, whose marriage was on the brink of utter disaster, and they came to this church, and they heard the message, and they said, are you really that kind of God? And he said, I really am. There's been restoration. People that were addicted to all manner of things who came and said, are you really that kind of God? Is it really safe for me to approach? And God said it really is safe. 
He said, are you really willing? He said, I'm willing. They found freedom. People so chained down by sin and shame, they thought they could shake off of them. Who have found grace and a really approachable God. How can we keep that to ourselves? Some people in your world that are begging for you to reach out to them. I'm out of time. I'm still going to tell this story. I had an occasion for some years to go to Africa pretty often. It's different there. It's hard there. We worked in this orphanage there. I've been there many times and, and hundreds of kids, but I'd spent a couple of days there and there was this one particular kid. Most of the kids, life's hard there. Most of the kids were happy, but there was this one particular kid who never spoke stoic all the time. He didn't play with the other children. And I said, what's the story with this kid? And they said, well, we found him at the market. His mom had had too many kids. She couldn't afford to feed them all, so she decided to leave. She called this one, hoping that somebody might come find him. And here's what they said, but we found him a few years ago, so we don't know what his problem is now. Life's hard there. I was just so taken with this kid, you know, and I could tell he didn't really want me to. But I went over to this kid, and I could tell it made him a little nervous, but I couldn't help it. I just reached down, and I picked up this little boy, about seven or eight years old. And as I picked him up, he latched on to me, and he laid his little head right here. And the moment that I picked him up, scared as he was, his whole body just began to weep. And then he cried, and I cried. It was I just held him there. There's something about being touched sometimes when you don't even know it's what you need. And here's what I'm saying to you as we close. There's some people in your world and they may not even realize that they need that from you. But they need you to lay hold of them. They need you to infect them with the love and the grace and the mercy that only comes from Jesus might be you that God intends to use to bring them their healing today. God, bow your heads. God, we love you and we are grateful that you are that kind of God. That you really are that close to broken hearted people. God, I pray for broken hearted people in this room who may be far from you who may feel like you're a million miles away. I pray that you would remind them in this moment that you are closer than breath to them right now. And it is your heart to bring them their healing. God, we love you. Thank you for grace through Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. You got to stand and sing.
being here today. Um, real quick before we head out, you guys, when you go get your kids, tell Angie that if we went long, it was my fault. You know, she'll be all right. She'll forgive me probably, won't she, Chris Bryan? Probably, buddy. All right. If you're new here, I'd love the chance to meet you. Um, I'm going to head out over to this room, the hospitality hotspot, right over there. We got some refreshments in there and a little free gift to say thanks for being our guest. Marquita, are you over there? Right there. She's a sweet lady. She'll help take care of you over there, too. Um, if you would like to be baptized, I've talked to a couple of you already this week, and I've heard from you this week. I'm going to call on everybody that signed up this week for baptism, but we're going to baptize people next week. So if you're a believer in Jesus, but you have not taken that next step of obedience through baptism by immersion, we want to talk to you about that. And also, this is a big one. This is new right here. If you have volunteered anywhere in the last year in this place, and, and maybe beyond, we're having a volunteer appreciation celebration, okay? on October the 16th at 5 p.m., and we're doing it at Bose. All right? I know that's a little different this time. I'm super excited about it. Bring the family. We'll have several hours. Everything will be paid for for you to hang out with the family. We'll have legit food. We just need to know you're coming. Okay, so if you could sign up for that online, that would help us out a lot. I think that's it. You guys bow your heads with me. We'll be dismissed. God, thank you again for what you've done in this place this morning. Thank you that Jesus is good all the time. I pray that these folks will leave out of here willing to get over awkwardness or whatever it might be and reach out to the people in their lives who are crying out for help. God, we love them in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you guys. See you next week.